Hello, I'm Jyotika. Welcome to Excelling Psychology. I've been getting requests to cover year two A-level syllabus, that is A2 syllabus. So in this class, that's what I'm going to be doing. AQA psychology, year two syllabus I will be covering. And uh, I've taken approaches. I've been getting specific requests for approaches. I'm taking the learning approach in this video. Hopefully in coming videos, I'll be able to deal with other approaches as well. The reason for taking this approach is it is common to both the UK syllabus and Oxford International AQA syllabus as well. So this lesson should uh, be useful to both types of students. In this lesson, you can see on the screen, I have a compilation of past paper questions. No doubt they are from the UK syllabus that I have taken. But similar questions, the shorter ones come for. Uh, the Oxford syllabus as well. So shorter questions are going to be exactly the same, very suitable for practice. Even the longer questions, the essay, proper essay questions are worded in the same way for the Oxford international students. It's just that instead of getting these questions for like 16 marks, you would, if you're an Oxford student, you would get them for 20 marks. So you'll have to add a bit more of description and evaluation. But otherwise, the questions remain the same. And what you need to practice, how you need to structure the answer, write the content, everything remains the same. So in this class, what I intend to do is cover as much as possible. I won't be able to cover all the questions. It's a big compilation. But to cover uh, the shorter one or two shorter questions, first a descriptive one, an applicative one, so that you can just see how to answer different types of questions. And then to cover a full essay question as well. Uh, the intent of this video is not to give you ready-made answers, but to explain to you how to structure your answers, what content to use, what terminology to use, how to meet assessment objective requirements. That's why I'm making a video instead of just posting the answers on my website. Let's begin with the shorter questions. As we know, learning these approaches is not difficult. Understanding operant conditioning or classical conditioning is not the challenge even social learning theory for that matter. The challenge is in writing answers. So that is what this video is going to be about. I'm going to write answers. You can take them as model or sample answers. Please don't take them as this is only what you have to write. I'm not giving you answers to memorize. I'm giving you answers that you can learn structure, content, terminology and organization from. Okay, the first question is outline Skinner's research into reinforcement. Many students in AQA have this misconception that when they specify research, you have to only cover research studies. That is not what they are asking for. Research refers to studies or theories. So in this answer, I can take multiple approaches. I can cover a specific study by Skinner, which I intend to do here. Or I can also cover the general theory revolving around uh, reinforcement. The very basics I can cover positive, negative reinforcement and punishment or for that matter, even schedules of reinforcement, interval and ratio based schedules, because they're just saying research into reinforcement. Now, so much of different types of research and theories you must have learned from Skinner, depending on which textbook you are referring to. So you're free to write any of them. The key challenge here is to condense whatever you're writing into three points, because you can see they've allotted only three marks. And I know any study or any theory that you take of Skinner, you feel it's so lengthy, there's so much to elaborate, so many examples to give. So to restrict yourself to three points is the challenge. Let's see how we can do that with an example. Before that, let's note, like I do in every video, which assessment objectives have to be met for how many marks for this answer. It's a very direct outline question. No scenario is given. Definitely it does not make for AO2 application. Evaluation is not asked for in any way. So strengths and weaknesses haven't been asked for. It's clearly AO1 only. Only an, a descriptive answer is expected. Uh, what we've learned from the textbook, we have to note that in our own words, of course, using good terminology. I would like to summarize Skinner's classic rat box experiment in this, the Skinner box experiment. So what I'll do is, when it comes to longer answers and we are covering any study, we go by the format aim, procedure, results, conclusion. I'm going to follow the same format. It's just that aim I will write in one sentence, procedure in one, results in conclusion in one. 
so that will meet a three mark requirement and also make the research explicitly clear so in his classic experiment with the rat in the box skinner sought to investigate whether consequences of behavior can modify it the rat was rewarded with food pellets upon pressing a lever it then press the repeat, the liver repeatedly demonstrating that reinforcement encourages repetition of target behavior so i know the temptation must be there to write a lot of details about this study because the rat box experiment we've all learned in so many details like initially the rat accidentally pressed the lever and then how it went crazy in pressing the lever again and again but we have to restrict ourselves to 3 marks so that is how i do it you can see i've covered the aim in the first sentence the procedure very very briefly the key point in one sentence key point is about how the rat was rewarded because that was the target in this study and then result and conclusion in one sentence so always for a three marker question ao one type you can summarize a study that you're giving in this way if you're giving the theory instead by skinner and let's assume you're giving the base theory i'll just give you an example you can define in general what reinforcement is and then perhaps you can give two types of reinforcement definitions in one one sentence so say one sentence on what positive reinforcement is and one sentence on what negative reinforcement is so the, usually you just uh, take it as a rule of thumb to cover three points for three marks next question is an eo two type of question let's see the question first explain how reinforcement might be used to encourage primary school children to pick up litter in the playground so we can see a very specific scenario situation has been given here whereby we want to train children on a new behavior which is picking up litter from the playground now again there are multiple ways of answering this question also the key word here is the command term explain which means you have to give the how and why here chiefly how because it is ao2 this is entirely ao2 because they are aren't asking you to outline anything that you have learned in the textbook and they aren't asking you for any strengths or weaknesses so whatever points you give about reinforcement have to be specific to this context you must not give any points in isolation or general type of points or uh, your i was saying there are multiple approaches either again you can take the base theory of reinforcement punishment the first thing that would come to your mind is whenever children pick up litter they should be rewarded with something they desire let's say by praise or appreciation from the teacher and whenever they do not pick up litter despite being told to do that they could be punished in some way by say uh, uh, being given some writing homework some extra writing work or by detention or something like that so definitely that is the very basic you can apply it other possibilities are talking about schedules of reinforcement so let's say every five times every uh, or five days alternatively so either ratio or interval that children pick up litter from the playground we will be rewarding them that is one more way of uh, approaching the question right now the approach i'm taking is going to be based on token economy and i'll also tell you why 
because when it comes to small children like we've learned behavioral programs token economy is a very suitable approach for training them so when i saw children on the playground that's the first thing which came to my mind that token economy should really work here only thing is again token economy can be very long winded while explaining so i have to restrict myself to 3 marks i must never lose view of how many marks are attributed to the question while answering so uh, when it comes to token economy uh, i can cover in three sentences one sentence can be about uh, specifying token economy i don't need to define it in general because this is not a one so just specifying that a token economy program will be implemented next describing what the tokens can be and third describing for what rewards they can be redeemed three sentences will cover the full how of token economy being applied and that should be it okay so again i'll give you a sample answer for this a token economy program can be implemented the children could be rewarded with tokens in the form of plastic chips for every day that they picked up litter upon collection of 10 such tokens they could be rewarded with see a certificate of appreciation in exchange for the tokens i forgot to discuss about terminology even when i wrote the last answer terminology and structuring your answers well i've shown you how to structure but just to make it explicit whenever we are writing an answer starting with terminology we must not use casual language some students will write we can give stars to the children and then the later when they have 10 stars we can give them a praise you're talking about token economy you need to use words like tokens that is the official terminology that you need to use you need to talk about exchange of tokens you need to talk about the bigger rewards that can be given in exchange of tokens be it the learning approach or be it any topic in the syllabus what is important is to use words terms that you are using learning in the textbook every textbook at least which i have seen of aqa and i have seen many of them has special emphasis on terminology on the margins especially you will have key definitions key words key terms which are presented so always your attention should be towards them and in text also keywords are always bolded and uh, colored like in red or blue so you should make use of that when you are answering you should look like a psychology student is answering and not like someone who's having a casual conversation in the previous answer also you will see i have used words like consequences behavior reward reinforcement repetition that is how we need to go about writing these are good terminologies that we use i know for the shorter answers many times requirement is not there of using good terminology it can be reserved for the longer answers but regardless of whether the requirement is there or not you should have a habit of writing every answer with good terminology because after all when you are learning say you are learning classical conditioning or operant conditioning you know you might have to write long answers also from them so why not learn it only in with the perspective that i have to use good terminology in the paper so when you are answering the shorter ones also automatically when you are writing you will write with those terms always makes your answer look better 
makes a good impression on the examiner. Impression doesn't count for marks. I know that you don't get good marks because the examiner is impressed with you. You get good marks for your answers that you've written. But why not uh, make a good impression such that the examiner finds it easier to write your, read your answers and doesn't make those type of human errors in you know, getting confused and not getting the point of your answer. So essentially, it's about giving clarity to the examiners. Think of it that way. Okay, so I've covered the short answers, also talking about structuring. That is one more thing I needed to talk about. For the study, I've made it clear how you can structure always in procedure results. For a theory, like I have it here, and especially when we're applying it, always try to structure in a sequential format. Many students have this bad habit of uh, going back and forth between points, which makes it difficult for the examiner to understand what is happening. Like here, you can see I have written kind of stepwise how the token economy program should be implemented. So first, token should be rewarded later on when these many tokens are collected, they can be exchanged. Some students will write students can be, uh, these primary school students can be given supposing praise certificates. Then they'll go backwards to say because they must have collected these many tokens, then they'll introduce the element of how many tokens they must have uh, collected for how many behaviors, don't write the answer in a haphazard manner. Don't write it in a way that's like very confusing to understand where is it beginning, where is it ending. And what happens when the examiner is reading, they are supposing reading, okay, they'll be given certificates. So the assumption is you're talking about primary uh, or we can say positive reinforcement. And then suddenly you go back and say, but tokens were given. Now the examiner realizes, oh, you're talking about token economy. You aren't talking about direct rewards being given. So it's very confusing to the examiner exactly what are you talking about in the answer. Uh, always have clarity in your answers. It's always suggested before writing. Have clarity of thought. Know your answer fully, what you're going to write, and then put it down on paper. When you just read something comes to your mind, you start writing. That is when you go back and forth. You haven't planned the answer in your mind. You're just jotting it down on paper. So don't have that habit. Uh, you might feel that planning takes a lot of time. That's why you don't want to do it. You just want to begin to save time. First of all, rash approaches are never helpful. Like just starting to save time, it ends up wasting a lot of time because you have to keep on rectifying your errors, erasing. You spend much more time on an answer than you would have if you would have planned it properly. Secondly, practice is key. That's why it's so important to write answers. That's why in my video, I focus on answer writing more than teaching you the content of things. Because when you have practice, then all these things like planning and all won't take too much time because you've written so much by yourself when you're practicing at home that it comes spontaneously. In fact, the answers will seem so repetitive to you in the paper. Scenarios will be different, but you've practiced so many similar scenarios that very fast it will come to your mind. The plan will just come to your mind in a jiffy, like how you should go about it. So keep doing practice if you really struggle while writing the answers and you tend to cancel out and go back and forth and erase a lot and all. All this just shows that there is lack of practice. Okay, so I've covered one EO1 question. I've covered one EO2 question. Now I'd like to go a little back and cover a proper essay type of question. Unfortunately, today I don't have time for the 16 marker. I have covered 16 markers for other topics in some of my videos. You can look at them then. So let me take the 8 marker for today, which is like a a condensed form of the 16 marker. So I'll give you an idea on how to answer any type of essays. It's just that we'll be able to do it quickly. Okay, so the question is discuss the contribution of Pavlov's research to our understanding of human behavior. Here the key word is contribution. Many students in a haste, what they will read is discuss Pavlov's research in understanding of human behavior. And what they'll do is for AO1, they will uh, cover Pavlov's research. They will describe the dog experiment, salivation and dog experiment. They're not asking you to cover the research. They're not telling you to discuss Pavlov's research. What is the contribution of his research? How it has made a contribution to the field of psychology? That is what they want you to cover. So first thing is you can completely lose all eight marks if you misinterpret the question. Every word of a question is important, right from the command word till that full stop, which is there. 
so always again don't be in a haste don't be tense when you're answering the paper when you're tense when you're not prepared when you haven't practiced so practice well enough so that you can keep your mind straight when you're uh, answering the questions in the paper now the distribution of this answer is it's like half a version of your 16 marker so it is AO1 for 4 marks and AO3 for uh, 4 marks. I know in the 16 marker AO1 is 6 marks and AO3 is 10 marks. So it's not exactly the half of that. But this is the distribution uh, for this question. Regardless of uh, the distribution, like you don't need to be very focused on 4, 4 marks are given for each assessment objective. More than that, what you need to consider is how much to cover in each. So the description is worth four marks. Think about that. Half of my answer needs to be a description and half of my answer needs to be evaluation strengths and weaknesses. Again, the format that I'm giving you and the answer I'm going to write, both are like models. Does not have to be exactly this way. I find this the best and the easiest approach. That's why I'm suggesting it to you. For AO1, just give four points of any one contribution. So think of one contribution that has been made stick to that and uh, give four points on that for AO3 you can give even one point in peel format if you give it in details even that should suffice for four marks but right now I would suggest one strength and one weakness both of course in peel format only even if it becomes a little elaborate it's okay but one strength one weakness in the peel format to justify AO3 now let's consider before writing anything, what are the contributions of Pavlov's research? Two things come to my mind. One is definitely application because any theory contributes in terms of application. This is particularly important when it comes to approaches because in approaches we are learning a lot of theoretical concepts. Now when we talk about contribution, what are we talking about? We are talking about applications. So one thing is to consider the application. When it comes to the classical conditioning paradigm, which is Pavlov's research, the uh, first application that comes to mind is what we've learned in psychopathology unit last year, uh, treatment of phobias using systematic desensitization. For that matter, even flooding applies, but I feel systematic desensitization is a more direct application. Another thing that comes to my mind in terms of contribution is the whole paradigm of research paradigm in the sense giving a model for how experimental research should be done in the area of classical conditioning. So when it comes to Pavlov, the way he conducted his study, the dog bell study, that gave an idea to other researchers on how they can do similar experiments on classical conditioning. Again, what my, comes to my mind is from the psychopathology phobia unit, a uh, little Albert study. Uh, that was done in the exact paradigm of the dog bell experiment. Instead of dog and bell, it was the loud sound being made behind Albert's head and the rat, white rat. So the loud sound was the unconditioned stimulus and the white rat was the conditioned stimulus. So now what I can do is either I can take application systematic desensitization, describe it for four marks to cover my AO1, or I can take the paradigm and describe that for four marks. I'm not taking the paradigm right now. If you do, just uh, take that approach. I'll just tell you how you can do it. First, describe what the paradigm is in general, taking UCS, CS, UCR and CR. And then just give three uh, sentences condensing uh, the little Albert study. And uh, also talk a little about like one sentence on what is the contribution of the little Albert study in understanding phobias in psychology. So that's a really big contribution because it's under psychopathology, helps in treatment of patients. So about five to six sentences you can cover for AO1 in this way if you take the paradigm. I'll take the application, I'll explain to you while writing only how we can go about it. Now coming to one strength, one weakness. If I take the paradigm thing on uh, little Albert, of course you can give any other experiment also. My example is of little Albert because it's very applicable also and it is the most uh, classic research work which has been done using Pavlov's paradigm. One strength of that definitely is that it has contributed to treatment. Practical value is very high. Uh, it has given understanding of a very specific disorder. But the weakness of that is that that whole study, you can take a criticism of Little Albert's study only, highly artificial, experimental in nature might not be applicable to um, or ecologically valid when it comes to real development of phobia. So might not be very useful in that sense. Right now I'm going to take application. So when I'm writing only, I'll show you what one strength and one weakness is possible. 
okay i haven't uh, got space here to write my answer so i'll just add a page and i'll write the answer there so let's scroll down a little yeah i'll write my answer here preferably in terms of organization writing two paragraphs should make the answer very neat two separate paragraphs one on ao1 the other on ao2 so what i would like to write is pavlov's research has contributed by providing an application in the form of treatment of phobias I want you to know two things about how I'm structuring my answer here. One, I'm not wasting any time writing about Pavlov's research because that hasn't been asked. I'm not going to describe the dog bell experiment or general terms like UCS, CS, and all because I'm not talking about the paradigm. So, for things which I'm not going to receive credit, I'm not going to waste any of my answer space or answer words for that. Secondly, you will notice in my every answer, I directly address the question in the first sentence. They have asked me what is the contribution. Explicitly, I have specified the contribution is treatment of phobias. I will not beat around the bush first with their systematic desensitization, this, that, and in the end, write, oh, this is a treatment for phobias. Begin right at the point where it uh, primes the examiner as to what is going to be discussed in the rest of the answer. Signposting, as I've discussed in my previous videos also. So, in the treatment of phobias, Specifically, a treatment called systematic desensitization is based on his classical conditioning theory. As I've mentioned in the previous answer as well, any specific study does not have to be the research. The general classical conditioning theory is the research done by Pavlov. So I'm connecting the specific theory systematic desensitization to that research. Now the rest of my EO1, about three, four sentences more, is going to be about systematic desensitization and its importance. Of course, not as, as a strength point of view, that I'll cover in EO3. But just generally why it is important, that I will explain because that will show the significance of Pavlov's contribution. In this theory, using the principle of reciprocal determinism, a patient of phobia is thought to relax in response to phobic stimuli this prevents stress in response sorry fear in response to the stimuli gradually breaking the association between fear and the stimulus and building a new association between relaxation and the stimulus. Systematic desensitization is the most popular behavioral treatment
of phobias today? That has been successfully used. In the treatment of. Thousands of patients in several years. I'm a little short on time, but I will like quickly point out to you the use of terminology in my answer. So reciprocal determinism, association, phobia, uh, behavioral treatment, relaxation, fear. You can see all terminologies I've used such that effectively I have used the terminology to bring about how systematic desensitization directly relates with classical conditioning. Association is very important to demonstrate and that is how I have incorporated uh, the link between classical conditioning and systematic desensitization. So that you can read this answer, so keep it in front of you when you're watching this video or refer to it later. I'll upload it on my website and link it in the description box and the pinned comment below. So you need more time to read this answer and understand better the structuring and organization, use of terminology, you'll be able to do that. Let's move towards the next paragraph, which is going to be on EO3. As I've said before, you can have only one point, but I'll give two points in the peel format. I don't have time to explain the peel format right now. You can visit some of my previous videos to understand what it is. One strength of Pavlov's contribution in the form of this treatment has been to present an ethical treatment for phobias. I'm going to emphasize how systematic desensitization is ethical. I've already shown the practical value in the past paragraph. But the strength of it being ethical, that I want to bring about as a strength because we need ethical treatments for phobic patients such that they do not have to undergo any trauma while undergoing therapy. So that I'm taking as a strength. What might come to your mind is I am giving strengths and weaknesses of systematic desensitization in a question on Pavlov. Of course, because systematic desensitization is his contribution. Indirectly, he has led to the treatment which has been given by Volpe. So, of course, when I'm evaluating systematic desensitization, I am evaluating his contribution. So, it makes sense to evaluate it. Unlike comparable, or sorry, unlike alternative treatments like flooding, which can be traumatic, to already fearful patients. Because of its intense nature, this treatment gradually reduces fear. in a way that is manageable by the patient. Thus, it helps overcome phobia without causing any harm to the patient in the process. An alternative strength could also be the customizable nature of the treatment, developing the hierarchy in accordance with the uh, requirements of the patient, which makes it very successful, a very ideographic type of treatment. Also, I'll give one weakness, although like I've told you, this should suffice for AO3. 
I prefer giving one more point. In the paper, you can also uh, decide how much you want to write based on how much time you are having. One weakness is that this treatment makes for a reductionist therapy for phobia. We know alternative treatments are available and why it's reductionist is it does not consider the whole aspect of the person. How we can put it is only behaviors of fear are targeted in it. Ignoring other aspects that need to be addressed. such as biochemical problems in the brains of patients. Treatments like anti-anxiety medication that bring back levels of norepinephrine to normal can help address these issues better. Thus, Pavlov's contribution has resulted in an effective but partial treatment for phobia. Okay, that's all I have to offer for today. So we have covered all sorts of questions that can come from the learning approach in the sense we've seen an AO1 answer, AO2 and AO3 answer. Let me know what feedback you have on this video, any comments, any concerns that you have in the comment box below. I do watch for the comments. I do answer comments below. So any queries that you have, I will answer there. If you're looking out for tuition for psychology, you can contact me on my personal number or email ID given below. Uh, and let me know what other videos you would like to see on AQA psychology or uh, whether you'd like me to explain content or continue with answer writing or you want me to do something else. Okay, so thank you for watching this video for today and uh, keep enjoying your learning of AQA psychology. I must say one opinion of mine, AQA psychology has the best international curriculum for psychology. I have been taking up at Excel uh, Cambridge, IB, all psychology uh, courses. You're very lucky if you're in the AQA board, you have the best curriculum with you. So enjoy your learning process and I will see you very soon in another video. That's all for today. Goodbye.